Happy Saturday and welcome to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark. It is Saturday, February 6th. You know, you ever notice how I always look down at the calendar when we start? Because I'm always in disbelief about how fast time is flying. I think that's a result of me getting older. Uh, <laughs> so time moves a lot quicker. But, but I don't want to waste any time because I have two very good people on today to talk about something that's been bothering me and it should be bothering you is sort of the ascent of uh, these white supremacist organizations like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. And it culminated on January the 6th of uh, them trying to storm the Capitol and, and kill the Speaker of the House and, and uh, threaten the Vice President. And, uh, and these folks are still walking around and I think they're still growing in, uh, in influence. Um, and then there's one congressman in particular, Congress, Congresswoman from Georgia, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was just uh, removed from committee assignments, but I don't think that's enough. So I got two people that are gonna help me try to figure this out. Uh, one you already know, and that's Val Atkinson. He's our resident political uh, science expert, former professor at North Carolina Central University. Uh, and you know him from Connections as well here in the Raleigh-Durham area. And then Alexandra Stern, who's a professor at Michigan Uni University of Michigan. All this blue today, uh, <laughs> UNC, Chapel Hill, Duke, and Michigan. Uh, the big blue, uh, Michigan, uh, Alexandra Stern, who has written a book about the Proud Boys, and we want to talk with her, and she's been a guest with us before. So welcome to the deal, folks. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, you know, I, I, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Stern, because um, when we talked the last time, uh, the the crisis of the moment was the attempt to uh, kidnap and murder the governor of Michigan. Uh, and uh, 11 or so people were arrested. And it seemed to have just passed out of the news. That That, that is like, okay, so these people threatened to kidnap the governor and we arrested them and it's over now. But we saw that it was not over. Uh, that was just the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, of the kind of behavior that we knew they were capable of. Can you catch us up with what's going on in Michigan and then talk to me broadly about uh, where the Proud Boys in those kind of groups are right now? Yeah, well, it's great to be back. Um, and uh, it's important to talk about these really awful and scary things that are happening and how to understand them and how to counteract them and work for progressive change. So I'm really glad to be here with you to think about that together. I was, after you contacted me, I was thinking back to when did we last talk? And you're right, it was right after the plot against Governor Whitmer in the state of Michigan. And since I live in Michigan, I've been keeping up with that. And now, you know, I guess it was even close to six months ago, like you said, time is going fast as we faster as we get older. So, um, but so much has happened in those kind of quick six months. And I have a few reflections. First is that what we saw happen in Michigan, both with the protests in the spring and summer, I'm talking about the protest against the COVID public health restrictions, um, the coming together, of these far right actors who wanted to kidnap and kill the governor and all of that, you know, in a way that was kind of in a microcosm, what happened on January 6th. In a lot of ways, things that happened in over the course of those months and particularly with targeting, right? Targeting democratic leaders as happened on January 6th. And if you look at the actors that were involved with, in it, what their ideas were, how they mobilized in terms of using social media platforms um, and what their kind of ultimate goals were, which was to, to kind of to stop democracy in its tracks, it's the anti-democratic impulses. So looking back at that, we can kind of, you know, we could tease out some of what happened in Michigan and then think about it, you know, kind of apply that to, um, you know, everything that unfolded and led up to January 6th. And a lot has happened. I mean, kind of, some of the flashpoints that I think of kind of tracing from the summer to where we are now is, first of all, the presidential debate, the one where um, the former president 
pounded his chest and made call outs to the Proud Boys, telling them to stand back and stand by and really mobilizing the Proud Boys and shouting out to other similar groups. And, you know, the Proud Boys took that as a great recognition. They immediately redesigned, like within an hour after he said that, they had designed memes and even created new t-shirts, which had the logo, you know, stand back and stand by. So they, that for them was a huge recruiting tool. So then, you know, things continue on through the, um, the actual election. Trump had been saying for years that, you know, he was going to say the election was fraudulent. This was not a new script. And he enacted it just as he said he would. And there was even more fertile ground or, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of believers that were fueled by QAnon, by everything that happened over 2020 with kind of COVID and all of that. And so, you know, that created, I would say, it was like an accelerant and an intensifier for everything that led up to January 6th. And, you know, I guess one of the things that I've been reflecting on is there's been a lot of news coverage. So if you look at the New York Times or the newspapers, they're looking a lot at who were the people at the, let's call it the Capitol insurrection. Um, you know, where did they come from? What was this mishmash of people from the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three, Presenter, three Percenters to like random business people who showed up because they're, they just wanted to support Trump and or QAnon supporters and so on. And I do think it's important to figure out who they were, but what I am, what I am most interested in and concerned about and that what I tried to look at in my book was what are the ideas? How have far right ideas saturated American society? They have become mainstreamed. What are those ideas? How do we recognize them? And um, how do we counteract them? So I think yeah. that there's a lack of attention to kind of the ideologies and how those have even stronger roots um, and places to, uh, and, and, and they've been oxygenated yeah. and, and more room to breathe and grow. So I'm interested in the people, but I think focusing on the people can, is part of the puzzle, but really focusing on the toxic ideologies and understanding them is super important. Yeah, I, I hear you. This is a good place to bring in uh, Val Atkinson. Val, you and I over the years have talked an awful lot about, um, uh, you know, the sort of undercurrent of this uh, white male resentment. Um, you, know, you know, we've been on the radio. I've been on the radio with you for 25 years, and, and I was writing about it even before then about these people who are saying that white men are being oppressed at the same time, while they're, they're still the billionaires, they still run all the corporations and all, all those things. How do you square that? How, where does that, where does that white male resentment come from? Uh, it, is any of it real? I mean, sh should we be just dismissive of it altogether? Cause I want to get back to Dr. Stern and, and, and ha have her help me figure out if it's mainstreamed, it means that, you know, the vast majority of people believe it or whatever, but where, where does it come from when it's obvious to us, at least to me, that it's not true? Well, it's always been a huge question in my mind, Ed, you know, the origins of it. And it never became clearer than it was after I read Isabel Wilkerson's book, uh, Cast, uh, or the origins of our discontents. Uh, and that brought everything to light to me. Uh, and basically what she's saying that I grasped on was that it's always been this way as uh, way as far back as uh, the Americans and the British and other Europeans deciding that white supremacy was in their advantage that without it, it was gonna be difficult to get lower economic people to work on their behalf, to bring in the riches. They had to have something to make that work. And white supremacy and the resulting white privilege was the key. It was the ticket 
to getting that. You know, I'm an old Civil War buff, and the questions always came up in my class. How did guys who weren't slave owners and didn't profit from slavery necessarily, how did you convince them to go lay down their lives and destroy their families to fight for the Confederacy? Well, it was about the business of culture. It was about the business of, as they call it, their way of life. And some people have now really combined all of this into saying it's Americana. And they have sold that. Some people have bought that. I believe that's what Dr. Stern is talking about here when we talk about it going mainstream. Some people have bought into that and they see this whole racial uh, relations game as a zero sum game. And they don't feel that there's anything that non-whites can do uh, to advantage themselves without white folks losing and losing bad. Mm -hmm. Now in comes the people who are saying, we, we are the victims, really. Yeah. We're us, we're, we one percent is us billionaires. We're the victims. So. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I don't and, feel that way. Worked, but that's where it started <laughs> in my mind. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. Uh, so I, I do want to remind the folks you're watching the deal with Ed Clark. Uh, that's Val Atkinson, and that's Dr. Uh, Stern from the University of Michigan. We're, we're trying to make sense of uh, this white resentment, the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, three percenters, this whole thing. And Dr. Stern, as I listen to Val, uh, we, we, we do have a tendency uh, to sort of idealize American history. I mean, I, I, I've always had this thought, I had this book in my head for the last 40 years that I should write about, about the mythology of, of, uh, of America. Um, I, I often, all my friends know that I, I often talk about the religion of Americana. That that, uh, uh, that that we don't we're not really Christians we're Americans uh, that that we're so different from Christianity anywhere else in, in, in the Western world that is so focused on Americans so that things like the Church of the Latter Day Saints uh, isn't so far away from some of the <laughs> mainstream what you would call evangelical churches but 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 let's talk about this through line all the way back through history from the very founding of America up to today what do you see as the through line from from the founding of the country to uh, these proud boys now uh, uh, do they use patriotism you know the connection to being Americans or whatever to to bolster the movement you know to say that they're authentic Americans and other people aren't or you know how, how do they use history to uh, try to advance their cause yeah, I think that whole framing of using history and using it as a resource and looking at how mythologies are constructed is a really helpful way to think about how do these groups attempt to write themselves into the present. So on the one hand, there's a very long through line that we all recognize and know about, which is about this country being founded on white supremacy, including slavery, and racism, as well as dispossession and genocidal, the genocide of Native Americans. Like that's part of, so there's like, so we could go back, let's just say to, you know, 1619. We can go to 1790 with the Naturalization Act. I mean, we can look at these various points with actually some changes coming by, like what we, with, well, the failed first reconstruction, the second reconstruction, you know, of the 50s and 1950s and 60s, you know, with some actual changes being made, you know, often due to the 14th Amendment. I mean, imagine this country without the 14th Amendment. I often like to talk to my students about that. But in any case, so if let's what let's think about the mythologies that are being used by those on the far right because i think that's helpful to understand how as distorted as it may be how are they using history so most of you all listening and and uh, you ed and val you remember the you know those images from in front of the capitol and there were so many flags that were there and placards that were there and those were, I think of those as basically a historical narrative, like they're attempting to, to tell their version of history through, you know, the three percenters logo through the don't tread on me. So it's all there. 
And it's all culminating in this moment where they feel that they have the right and are emboldened to, you know, be the people to, you know, take over the capital because they have been victimized because they have not been heard through, you know, layers and layers of this, what they would view as this kind of historical oppression and marginalization, even though that just seems it's, it's tortured, right. in how they explain it. Um, so I would say that, you know, one of the things that, you know, Trump was so good at was he was fanning the flames of white male victimhood. I mean, that was one of his, um, you know, kind of, that was one of his, uh, he did that on a regular basis. And I think that really added a layer to this. So on the one hand, this has been around for centuries and centuries. On the other hand, we do see a kind of new incarnation of these racist white supremacist white nationalist forces in the context of the 21st century and then we need to think about why what does it look like and how do we deal with it yeah that that's an excellent uh culmination of of, of that long thought i had <laughs> but, uh, this is also a good place for us to take a break can you stay on for the next segment dr stern and, and Val, obviously, I want to have you back. Now, we, we I, I tell people all the time here, we try to put stuff in context and do the historical part. The next part of this is I want Dr. Stern to tell me how afraid I should be. <laughs> and, and, what, and what are we going to do about this uh, in light of the fact that we know what the historical context is now? What, what do we do right now? So you guys stay right there. We'll be back in a minute. Uh, you're watching the deal with Ed Clark. Welcome back to The Deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark, and that's uh, Dr. Alexandria Stern from University of Michigan, friend of the program, and thankful that she can come back and talk to us today. And everybody knows Val Atkinson. Uh, he's here every week. I, I do have a program note. Um, the other member of our panel, uh, the, the good doctor from Fayetteville State, uh, I told you that her family was uh, going through some COVID-19 uh, situation with her mother. Things are much better, so we're hoping to have her back next week. So um, let's hope all that works out. But in the meantime, let's get back to this discussion. Uh, folks, we've talked about the history, and, and I make a point of talking about the history on this program every, every week, uh, Val and Dr. Stern. Um, I want to talk about the present, though, the very present today. Uh, and what the existential threat of a group like the Proud Boys is or, or uh, the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, uh, they were willing to storm the Capitol. And, and, we've, and people have been arrested. I don't think enough people. The fact that they even were able to storm the Capitol is disturbing to me, that there weren't forces arrayed to try to stop that. So I'm going to go to you, Dr. Stern, first. Uh, what should I be afraid of today? You've studied these groups. You know what they do and what their goals are. Are they, are they dangerous? Can I mock them and make fun of them uh, but still keep an eye open? Or should I have my eye open and not mock them and make fun of them? You know what I mean? I mean, you know, sometimes mockery, you know, and, and that they're just crazy, stupid people is one way we deal with stuff like this. But I'm not sure about these guys. I'm not sure if I should just be afraid of them and take them as a serious threat. Well, I think it's a balancing act between recognizing the threat that they pose and um, not ceding so much power to them that you actually feel, you know, afraid. And so that is an ongoing balance that, you know, many people have faced over centuries in this country, right? So that's one way to think about it. But what I would say is that what is most concerning to me about what we've seen in recent months that was apparent, but has become even more apparent is the militiaization is what I would call it of these far right groups. So on the one hand, there are these vigilante militia type groups, 
such as the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters. And they are paramilitary type organizations. And in fact, many of them, many of their members hail, they were veterans or they come from uh, former law enforcement backgrounds and so on. So that is concerning and their, and, and their rhetoric around the second amendment, around gun rights and all of that has saturated into some of these other groups. When I wrote about, the, when I was studying the Proud Boys really closely tracing their, um, the establishment of the group in 2016 through to like 2019, I knew that they were a street fighting organization, that their guys love to go out and brawl in Portland or New York City, and they were always looking out for Antifa. And so, and they were, you know, on social media, they're always really xenophobic and racist, even though they have a multiracial contingent, which is a whole other conversation we can talk about, but all of that. So I knew that, but I did not anticipate the extent to which they became under this broader militia eyes tent, which is what we're seeing. So that is concerning to me. And that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin that is very concerning is the extent to which uh, the military forces and law enforcement itself contains, at least in, it's uneven, but contains far right elements and white nationalist beliefs and neo-Nazis. So you've seen that the department, the, the new kind of head of the Department of Defense has said, every, all, I want all the military to stand down uh, for a, a period of time while we examine the problem of white nationalism in the US military. So anytime you have these types of, and we'll just kind of broad, call them broadly fascist ideologies that are connected to military forces, that is scary and we can, that's where it behooves us to look, to think about what's going on in this country, but also to look outside of the US. At, uh, we can look at Belarus right now, what's going on there, but we can also look at other examples such as what happened in Argentina and Brazil, um, you know, in the 60s and 70s and so on. So that, that really concerns me. And then I'll just, the other element of it is the fact that social media continues to be a very active recruiting arena for these groups. And there's just the whack-a-mole approach of, you know, finally Twitter took the step and the others took the step of, of removing Trump uh, because of his misinformation, his lies, his incitement to violence. But there is a, a lot, like you can go on Twitter right now and I could point you to all kinds of white nationalist content. Some of it is more obvious, some of it is more nod and wink you know, kind of a dog whistling, but it's not hard to recognize those whistles. Um, so that concerns me as well is just social media and not just Facebook, Twitter, but also what's happening with, you know, Gab and some of these other, you know, Telegram, Discord, some of these other technologies. And it's not that they shouldn't exist, but it's that the way they have been set up and the kinds of violent violence they have enabled is something that is seriously concerning. Yeah, yeah, that's Dr. Alexandria Stern. She's uh, with, uh, at the University of Michigan. She's written a very good book about the Proud Boys. I'll make sure I have a link for it out there. Uh, and, and that's Val Atkinson. Val, you, you have a connection to the military. You were in the recruiting command. You used to recruit people into the military before you became a college professor. Uh, in, in the time that you were doing it, I, I guess it was just transitioning from being a draft army into a volunteer army. Uh, were you seeing those kind of people join the army then? Not because the military has always had a very strong Southern connection with, with you know, uh, drill sergeants always being some, you know, racist Southern guy in all the movies. Uh, but there is a grain of truth to it because my gunnery sergeant was a uh, was one of those guys. Can you talk about uh, what the military is like in terms of, do they, they, can't, they apparently aren't ferreting out these people. How did they get into the military and why do they go? Well, I'd like to associate myself completely with all of the things that Dr. Stern just said, particularly which he talked about the military and uh, Lloyd Austin, our new secretary of defense uh, and, and what he's doing. He made his first priority 
that of ferreting out, of identifying, taking a look at internal issues uh, in the Defense Department. I think that is wonderful. And anybody who's ever been in the military will tell you the worst thing that can happen to a career soldier, particularly an officer, is to not to have a favorable response to the last question on your OER. Your OER is the officer's efficiency rating. And that last question used to say, I don't know what it looks like now, but it used to ask, does this soldier support the military's equal opportunity and race relations program? If you don't get an affirmative response from that, your career is over. Your military career is over. So it, it, it sets a tone that everybody knows that if you are identified as not supporting the military's race relations and EEO program, uh, you better find yourself a different career. And to have the top person, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense say, we are going to take a look at that. I can tell you right now from my experience, Ed and, and Dr. Stern, a lot of people right now are really nervous and I'm glad they are because they're going to be identified. And at, at, at best they can hope is that it just hurts their career, but it, it could end up worse than that. They could be identified as being a part of uh, and a player in helping people who are coming into the military for the wrong reason to get the training, to go back out and join organizations like Proud Boards and that sort of things. We know they are doing that in the military and in uh, civilian law enforcement, uh, police department, sheriff's departments and whatever. They're joining these organizations to get the experience to go back. And uh, th that is troublesome. But to answer your question directly, Ed, uh, the military, I spent 20 years and seven days in the United States Army. It's been a career. And I can tell you, uh, it's something that we as non-white soldiers, airmen and sail, uh, sailors, had to deal with all of our career. The military was a place of abject racism at one point. I mean, you had to really deal with it and accept it. Uh, and it didn't start turning around until after World War II when people and some of the troops start coming back home and they realized that they didn't have to be treated like dogs. And there were some white people in the world that didn't treat them that way. And uh, they came back and joined the civil rights movement. But uh, it's been that way in the military for years and years and years. And I would not be surprised to learn it, that it is still that way now. Yeah. So, so, you know, um, we're, we're going to, run out of time like we always do and it's never enough time for these discussions dr stern uh first i want to thank you for coming back in and, and spending time with us uh, on your saturday morning when you could be doing something else but uh, obviously we're going to have to have you back over the course of the year i want to talk to you about a whole bunch of other things too about your writing on eugenics and and and, and some other things that that piqued my interest uh, when i go look at your your body of work, but you know, I, I guess the last thing I'll ask you in the, in the last couple of minutes we had with you is uh, this Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, and Val and I will dig a little bit deeper into it after you leave, but um, it, she's just emblematic of, just like Trump was, they're not the issue, they are signs of, a, of the issue, right? They're, they're the symptoms of the disease that, that lies underneath. Uh, at removing her from committee assignments, she said that good, that gives her more time to act up, right? And, and so did Madison Cawthorn, who is a new representative from North Carolina. He says, well, good, I don't, I don't, I don't need to be on committees and do this other stuff. I'm just here to throw hand grenades. Um, even though they're singular people, just like Donald Trump was, what, what, what does her even being in Congress say not only about her district, but about how we're willing to kind of still let this go. Ke Kevin McCarthy did not do enough to rein her in. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, you're spot on with um, calling her, you know, the symptom and, and Cawthorn as symptoms of a much larger problem. And, um, you know, the fact that she remains in Congress and that I think it was 
90, I can't remember the exact number, but, you know, the majority of Republicans in Congress, you know, su supported her it just shows how distorted white supremacy can become in, it always has been distorted, but all of the different strange tentacles it can grow from QAnon to everything else. So that's one thing. Secondly, though, I think it's important to, you know, recognize that from the perspective of white nationalists, January 6th was a huge triumph. It's like a great rec recruiting tool. And that's why I'm always concerned when I see MSNBC or CNN showing endless, endless clips of this because they are reinforcing and giving airtime to what is, you know, seen as this great moment of kind of, you know, step one of taking back the country for white people, for those who don't want to be part of the, what they see as like diversity Inc. democratic establishment. Um, so that, and just what she said is very much in keeping with the rhetoric of these groups, which is that, you know, this makes me even more of a dissident. And if, you know, if you want to be part of today's like counterculture, then you join the far right, you join white nationalists. So that is, you know, she's playing into that, that rhetoric. Um, and, you know, there are many who see her as a heroine, just as they do with Bobart in, from Colorado, who is a very similar ideology and aesthetic, frankly, in terms of they like to be gun toting and, um, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, I welcome the opportunity to come back and we can unpack some of this more, um, particularly in terms of thinking about there's the whole issue of the gender ideologies of these groups and how that plays into how toxic they are, like the, the sexism and the racism reinforce each other in various ways. And even though, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a woman, she's reinforcing that with her own politics and stances too. Um, and that often gets too little attention in the grand scheme of things. Yes, you know, a lot to unpack. And, and again, <laughs> I, I appreciate you uh, uh, entertaining us, uh, the offer to come and, and hopefully you'll come back and we'll talk about this. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, Val and I are going to deal with Marjorie Taylor Greene. We're going to deal with budget reconciliation. We're going to talk about Black History Month, a whole bunch of other stuff in the last segment. But again, uh, I'll have a link to uh, Dr. Stern's website uh, on, on all our uh, media uh, to make sure, buy her book, please, because it's really good. Uh, uh, Dr. Stern, are you working on anything else right now? What, what's your research right now? Well, I'm doing, I continue to work on the eugenics project, which is a whole multi-institutional team-based approach where we are doing a lot of work actually on North Carolina and thinking about that in the context of the South that I'd be happy to talk to you about at sure. some point. And then I continue to write about really far-right ideologies and thinking about them transatlantically as well, because there are many linkages between the far right in the US and the far right, particularly in Europe, Mm -hmm. Many of these guys have gone to train in Ukraine. They're training with nationalists like par paramilitary nationalist groups in other parts of the world. And again, that doesn't get enough attention. So it's part yeah. of this global phenomenon. So I'm working on all that. And the one thing I would say is that if you look at my book on Amazon, it has not great ratings because it's been completely trolled by the proud boys my book has to so that's okay okay good but we share that so it's like i view that as like needing to deplatform them from amazon ratings yeah so don't let that dissuade you from the book because they basically once they learned about it they decided to try to destroy it by saying that you know i was just a leftist shill and all that kind sure. of stuff that they say yeah of course well, well, that's that's Dr. Alexandria Stern. She's a friend of the program. That's Val Atkinson. He's going to be back with me in just a minute. We're going to take a break. We'll see you in about a minute. Happy birthday to you. I've never done this before. Happy birthday to you. We're here for Precious. Happy birthday, dear precious. Day four. You, you may not understand. Happy birthday to you. Yeah, 
So it's chapter 32. And welcome back to the final segment of the deal. I'm your host, Ed Clark, and that's Val Atkinson over there uh, holding it down. Um, unfortunately, he still has to wear that damn Duke sweatshirt, uh, which is okay. I mean, you got to you gotta like somebody, I guess. Uh, and, 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 and we just had Dr. Alexandria Stern from the University of Michigan, who I, I stumbled across her book about the Proud Boys, Val, uh, and, um, you know, months ago. And, and, and it was leading up to uh, the election and, and we had her on the program and, and we talked to her about uh, the plot to kidnap the governor of Michigan and kill her. And, and it seems to me that we still don't have a good handle on these people, Val. Uh, and, and we ended the last segment talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is the congressperson from Georgia, who has lost her committee assignments uh, there were people on the Republican side saying, well, if you if you do this, if you take away her committee assignment, then there's no bets on what's going to happen when we're back in power as if it was a threat. Kevin McCarthy uh, all but threatened the Democrats. Catch us up on Marjorie Taylor Greene. What does this mean? Uh, should we be concerned about when, when, because inevitably there will be a conservative party that comes into power at some point. It may not be called the Republicans, and we can deal with that later. But but uh, what uh, should we be concerned about that, or is doing the right thing the right thing? Right, removing her from the committee assignment was that the right thing to do? Doing the right thing is always the right thing to do, Ed. And I would say my advice to any Democratic decision makers always has been. Look, do the right thing and let's worry about the fallout later. Uh, my analogy that I give them or share with them is that, you know, if you are afraid to arrest the gang leader in town that's breaking up everything and uh, you're afraid to put him in jail because he may destroy your jail, you need to turn in your sheriff's badge. You need to let somebody else do that. That's not afraid to execute the law. Because once you take your oath, that's what you are signing up for. And Democrats have got to put on their big boy pants now. Uh, we're really in it. It's not a matter of trying to talk people into coming over to your side and tell them that the other guy is a bad guy and you're willing to compromise and negotiate and they are not. And uh, I think we're beyond that right now. And we're in a stage right now where it's time to put up or shut up. You gotta put up your dukes and you gotta fight. It's like uh, some of our moms used to tell us, I don't know if you can identify with this the brief story, Ed, but some of our moms used to tell us when we went home crying that some boy had beat us up in the playground. She used to run us right back out there and say, you go fight again. It ain't a matter of you winning or losing. It's a matter of you being strong enough and courageous enough to fight for what's right, to fight for what's yours. If you run now, you'll be running every day for the rest of your life. So get back out there and fight that guy again. And that, that's my message to the Democrats. Hey, let's cut this stuff out. Yep. It's time to fight now. Yep. Speaking of that, uh, I, I, I think there was a good start with uh, them deciding that they're going to go to reconciliation on, on the on the uh, package on the but uh, on the uh, recovery package and and so Kamala Harris had to cast the deciding vote but she was vote 51 because there was a 50 50 tie were you concerned that people like Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema and in in and Senator Kelly uh, may have uh, gone over to the Republicans because I still have a fear in the long run that there's going to be this constant thing with this 50-50 and, and no real, I, I know Mitt Romney and those folks went over to the White House, but I, they're still Republicans. And, 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 and I, I still don't have all that faith. Was that a good first uh, salvo from the Democrats that, that they're willing to stick together and Kamala Harris casting that vote to continue along with uh, the, 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 uh, recovery plan at 1.9 trillion and not, you know, acquiesce to the Republicans. I think it was the right move. Uh, 
the right thing to do. Remember, Joe Manchin, uh, he doesn't have a lot of places to go. I mean, you know, he's putting up a good battle to, to, to convince and scare uh, Nancy Pelosi into uh, doing whatever, you know, uh, he doesn't want her to do. But, you know, he runs, a, there's a risk here too, okay? He could lose his uh, committee assignments in terms of being chair or whatever. Uh, uh, people know that uh, the Democrats are depending upon him to be number 50. Uh, I said Nancy Pelosi, but uh, I meant the whole Democratic Party structure. They're really depending upon him. And uh, if, if he steps out, he's stepping away from the Democratic Party. Now, uh, he was not elected as a Republican and just, uh, or an independent and just decided to caucus with the Democratic Party. He was elected as a Democrat. That means he's got to run in a primary and a Democrat when he runs again for re-election. So there are some things that he's got to be concerned with too. If I were in the Democratic leadership, uh, I would not allow him to take over the Democratic Party by threatening to uh, not cast his vote the right way, not, you know, making this thing go uh, on the Republican side. I, I wouldn't allow him, I wouldn't give him that uh, uh, stick to beat us with. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely not. I, I'm, I'm really concerned uh, that uh, he, he hold, he hold the line and stay with the Democrats. You know, the whole Republican conference on the House side. We talked about the Senate a little bit on the House side. Uh, they seem to only have like ten or eleven people that are willing to be reasonable, uh, but they are reasonable to some extent. You can't count on them fully. The, the margin is very slim on the House side. Uh, what will the House be able to do? We've talked about the Senate. What would the House be able to do? Can they get some of these Republicans to reliably come over to the Democratic side, or is that wishful thinking on my part? Uh, <laughs> they were willing to sanction Marjorie Taylor Greene. They were willing to say impeachment was OK uh, against the president. Uh, so there's eight, nine, ten of them, right? Are they reliable or, or is it just those issues that they're reliable on? Democrats got to realize that this was a ploy. This was something that was cooked up by the Republican Party to say, we're going to send you some people who you think are pliable and flexible. And we're going to see if you really mean what you say when you say you are willing to negotiate and compromise and have bipartisanship. We're going to see. We're going to see what's going on here. This was a ploy. They had no intentions of, of coming up to the 1.9. And anywhere you come down off the 1.9, they know that some of your more progressive followers are going to think you're weak because you're not getting anything for it. And I'm on that side. My question to Democrats is, if you come down to 1.7 or 1.6 or whatever from 1.9, what are you getting for that? Tangibly, what are you getting for that? You are still back in 1989 trying to convince the little old widow lady in Iowa that when she decides her uh, swing vote, it should be with you because you're a nice guy. This is 2021. The political world doesn't work that way anymore. It's about time Democrats wakes up and sees that. Even Joe Biden is saying that he sees that now. Yeah. And he's uh, sending all kinds of signals out there that he is not going to come anywhere near the 600 billion that the Republicans are talking about. And if they want to come to 1.9, he'll welcome them. Uh, the, the whole business of compromising and bipartisanship is almost over. The uh, Democrat, the Republicans, have weaponized that whole system to their benefit, and they are used. They've used it against us, and it's about time that we realize that and wake up and see and stop trying to play that game. Yeah, they're using it to win battles. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 like you said, beat us over the head with it. Uh, you're watching the deal with Ed Clark. That's Val Atkinson in the in the last two segments. We had Dr. Alexandria Stern from 
University of Michigan. We've been talking about a wide range of issues today. Before we run out of time, Val, uh, we have managed to make it almost 45 minutes. And finally, we're going to say something about Donald Trump. The, the impeachment trial starts on Tuesday. This is a president has been impeached not once, but twice. Uh, uh, and um, it's not likely he's going to be convicted. Let's just say that. Let's just put that on the table, right? What can the Democrats do in their presentation that maybe will do enough damage to the Trump brand, more damage to the Trump brand, and maybe relegate him to you know, the trash heap of history? Is there anything that the Democrats can do in their presentation to hurt Trump even more? Or does it matter? Are those people so invested? Back to what we started this whole discussion about today. Are these people so invested in white supremacy and conspiracy and all this other stuff that it doesn't matter what you say about Donald Trump? It doesn't matter what evidence you present. You know he's not going to be convicted and they're just going to go about their business and act like this never happened. Is that what's going to happen? This the latter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the sooner Democrats realize this, and we have a whole lot of them who ain't bought into that idea yet, they still think it matters. And they still think if they can get the right group of words together and deliver this message with the right tonality and expression on their faces with good body language, that the Republic, somebody over there in the other camp is going to say, oh, I never looked at it that way. Let, let me take a look. Maybe I, you know, I wish I could set these people down for once and for all. It says, hey, guy, wake up. Here's the smelling salt. Wake up. It's a new day that don't work anymore. Stop wasting your time trying to do that. There's a whole field, another field of strategies out there that you need to be employing to win this battle. And you need to stop trying to convince the enemy to take that flower out of his muzzle of the gun that you've been putting in there and lay the gun down and come over and shake hands with you. Stop trying to do that. Because he's going to shoot you right between the eyes every chance he gets. Yeah, I, I'm not going to take the risk because I, I know they got uh, real live ammo in their guns. So I'm not, right. I'm not sticking daisies in the muzzles. That just shows how old we are, Val. Right. I know. <laughs> anyway, look, folks, uh, uh, we, we spent a, a good bit of your time today on Saturday talking about a lot of stuff. I do want to remind you come back next week because. Um, we want to talk a little more in depth about black history, um, trying to line up guests to talk about the history of Black History Month, because sometimes it gets a bad rap. Some people don't look at Black History Month for what it really is. Car Carter G. Woodson, who started Black History Month, had a real purpose for it because people were not paying attention to what people like Val have done uh, to, to help out the country and, and is overlooked. And as a direct result, Val, I'll make this argument that that's why we're here where we are, because people don't allow history to be told like it should. They, they, they leave out certain parts of history. So now there's this belief that America is exceptional. It's so great. The Constitution is uh, uh, unchangeable, irrefutable as the best document ever written, blah, blah, blah. This whole mythology around that. And it leads to the Proud Boys. It leads to the Oath Keepers. It leads to the 3% as well. Uh, like I said, we talk a lot about history here for a reason, because we don't think, at least I don't think, that people know their history well enough, and, and they start to believe this mythology, and it works its way into everyday life, and then you end up with somebody thinking that they have the right to invade the Capitol building <laughs> and threaten the speaker for some perceived slight that they're gonna start a new revolution, that that kind of nonsense. So uh, I do want to make sure you guys come back next week because we want to have a longer discussion about that. Hopefully Dr. Nicole McFarland will be back with us next week, uh, tending to some family business again this week. Uh, and Val, in the meantime, what are you working on? What, what do we need to look forward to? Well, I've started uh, on another creation. Uh, um, uh, going back to my roots right now, uh, one of my hobbies 
and the uh, moving title, and I say moving title because most of my writings, I changed the title three or four times before publication. <laughs> but right now, the title of the book is Why the Confederacy Won the Civil War. Mm. And, and I emphasize the word why because there are quite a few writings and books out there that talk about how the Confederacy really won the Civil War. And I talk about why I put it in three dimensions. Uh, I, at one point, the name of the book was going to be The Civil War in 3D. I thought of playing on words. First dimension was the political dimension, then the military dimension, and lastly was the culture or sociocultural dimension. And that's the dimension that the Confederates really won, mm -hmm. big time. And uh, you can just take it from those three dimensions to get a feel for what the book is going to be about. But I think it's going to be rather interesting. Yeah, yeah, that sounds exciting. I, I do have another programming note. I'm going to be on with you tomorrow <laughs> on Connections on Foxy 107, 104. So That's always right. Sunday morning at 8 a.m. So if you're up early and you live in the Raleigh-Durham area, all the way out to the coast, all the way up to Southern Virginia and almost down to South Carolina line, you can catch us on Foxy 107, 104 on Connections at 8 a.m. Uh, if you're in um, Timbuktu, you can listen on the internets. Uh, uh, if you just go to foxync.com and, uh, and listen to uh, Val Atkinson and Connections, he's been on there for 30 years, man. And, um, and I've been tagging along in and out for the last 25. So in the meantime, uh, I want you guys to have a great Saturday. Go out to the deal with edclark.com. Uh, share it with your friends. Uh, uh, read some of my blog posts. I always got something to say. I'm always running off at the mouth. You can always come here and watch the deal. Share that with the folks. We want to expand the audience for the deal. And in the meantime, go out and do something good for somebody today. And we'll see you next Saturday. You've been watching the deal with Ed Clark and Val Atkins. Bye.